Hello and welcome to Andrew Broussard Watercolors. I am jumping right into part two of painting the White House at Chelsea by Thomas Gritton. Well, essentially just doing a sketch and a study of it and trying to learn ideas and techniques as I go along. I'm using the quill brush now. This is a smaller one. I think I got it off of Blick.com. I'm mixing up a green with Prussian blue and raw sienna and now kind of mellowing it out with some um, burnt sienna. The purpose of these studies and experiments are to learn from the masters compositionally, um, painting brush techniques, and at least carrying some of these ideas over into my own personal style of painting. Uh, one of the big takeaways so far for this one was something that I had talked about in the past, but studying this one it seemed even more um, important. Looking at this painting, the horizontal brush strokes that are present in the water to create the horizontal plane, uh, that's a, been a reoccurring theme. Um, Eric Kopel, oil painter, modern oil painter who paints in the Hudson River Valley style, in a video had talked about the horizontal plane for water and in the previous study, looking at a Copley painting, we saw, I think that there was horizontal strokes there in the water, or at least you get the horizontal marks from reflections of light. And we just see the importance of it showing through again here. Then, and I always kind of think of Sargent when I talk about skies like being all over the place. This one, I was playing with the gradation and I had Carlson's Guide to Landscape Painting in my mind. I've been starting to reread that today. And I, there's gonna be the gradation vertically and horizontally. I'm going to kind of quote, not quote them, but summarize. That's the word I've been looking for. That even with the sun almost at its zenith, the tide's point in the northern hemisphere looking to the north, the sky is going to be darker. So you're going to have a change in that um, aspect there. Let's bring it a little bit just to wash down. Okay, so vertical gradation and horizontal gradation in the sky. But then to move things a little bit further, you don't have to have the horizontal and vertical brush strokes in the sky. You can play around with different lines and different shapes, which I did not take advantage of. I started to here. But now I'm realizing all those movements in the sky can be um, summarized by the simple brush strokes. Hopefully that's not. Ma hopefully that's making sense, and I'm not rambling too much. This painting is post workday, post afternoon nap, post mowing the yard. really need to bite the bullet and um, purchase a lawnmower that is self-propelling. It just gets exhausting and I think every video this summer I'm going to mention mowing. I really need to not do that, I'm sorry. So with Carlson's Guide to Landscape painting, and I mentioned this in the previous one, previous video, 
the sky is going to be your lightest tone. This is his theory of angles, and I'm going to do a video on that. I did one in the past, and I'll, re, I'll redo it. With his guide to angles, or theory of angles, the sky is going to be the lightest, excepting white buildings because, uh, you know, just not natural for the scene. Uh, snow is an exception. There's just a few exceptions for his theory that he has. Um, but your lightest tonal value sky, your second lightest, or if, as you go up the scale and get darker, your next thing is going to be the ground. The ground is going to catch most of the light from the sky, but it's going to filter through clouds, etc. It's going to have bumps and valleys on it, and it's going to have um, lights and darks. And then your darker element from that is going to be your ver vertical. These are going to be your trees. So we're just trying to keep those concepts in mind. I really like the difference in edges that kind of take place in master paintings. In some areas you'll have a nice crisp edge and in other areas you'll have um, kind of like a slightly bleeding edge. Yeah, Hammy. Let's just bring this wash down. Those horizontal brush strokes. Okay, super dark far background trees. Let's try light red oxide with some of that Prussian blue. Some of this is palette exploration. Exploration, blah blah blah. No, I cannot wait to go back to sleep. So what I'm trying to do here is have a slight separation tonality wise between my vertical elements, my trees, and the water shadow. Now in this painting, there was a list that I'd seen earlier that actually say the names of each one of these um, windmills and the church that are on either side of the White House, but don't know them off the top of my head. So let's put in the windmill here. I don't think I've ever painted a windmill. Okay, so since it's a vertical element, Carlson's theory is that this should have the darker aspects of it, darker tonal values. Now the blades or fans of the windmill. Um, actually something interesting that gets addressed in Carlson's guide in regard to that. He talks about a net. Just imagine that you have a net up against um, just hanging up a soccer goal, a black net, whatever you want. 
and at a distance it's going to appear gray. It appears gray because, or, or just tonally kind of a mid-tone, not as dark as it might be, you have the light shining through it, so the light wants to push the net to a lighter tone of value while you have the light itself with the black net around it where the black wants to push it to a darker tone of value. I'm gonna have to reread that section and just find a better way to phrase that. Now these are the reflections for there. And this building rising up. Originally when I started this I was just going to um, use white wash for the um, the White House, even though the Tate description said that the White House was essentially just painted by leaving the white of the paper. And I really didn't expect it to be able to lift like that. So very happy there. I might use white gouache for that reflection coming down. I'm going to put these little dots for the under portion of this bridge. And I want the tree line above it to be a little bit darker, tonally. darker on the vertical trees. There we go. Are we wet here? No, not too bad. I've got a boat. A ship. I've got to find out the differences between a boat and a ship. I have some friends that are boat captains. This guy should be darker tonally just using the idea that it's a vertical element. I'm just using the number one rigger which that's where the name of that brush comes from uh, for painting the, the rigging on sails. Might be a little too big, but mark that there. I think uh, every so often Lois Davidson posts like a really great uh, ship boat, sailboat painting. I forget what movement the maritime painting was a big part of. There we go. You have you right here. It kind of goes against my love of just using like a paint's gray or dark for some reflections using. Carlson's ideas. I wanted to play around with white gouache 
to see what would happen. Now, I would love for you to let me know in the comments below what you think if you would have used the white gouache or not. It was commonplace back then. I want to see if it, it just has to be so pure to get a good effect from it because the water being a little bit dirty, the brush just being a little muddy, you can see or hopefully it shows up that that is not working. Another bucket of wash water might be in store. To try that, let's just try a clean brush. Even that has difficulty. Okay. But what we can do is use that for a little bit of just mark variation in the sky, on the really lighter end of things. He really doesn't have that much mo movement in the sky in this one, but I'm going to go for it and just see how that dries, see how that changes. I use the white of the paper right here. Let's throw a little bit of white gouache in the sky right there around those edges. I'm using a larger quantity now rather than a wash to kind of just get that thick aspect. This is Da Vinci brand gouache. Um, Mind of Watercolor has a video up comparing different brands. I think that Da Vinci brand did not have the best opacity compared to others from his experiment, if I recall correctly. But I like Da Vinci brand and I like the price point, so it works for me. A little bit as the reflection here. We'll leave the white of the paper there. Let's separate the a little bit right there. There's really no. Try a wetter wash in the water. Let's see how that affects. To kind of talk a little bit about white gouache, we're near the end of this video. Um, Handprint.com had mentioned that in the 1800s, some would cover their painting with Chinese white, the, the paper, and then paint over it. Um, then from there, Joe Menza was talking about experimenting with that. And in one of the British art books I was going through, it said, kind of mentioned um, a wet and wet white watercolor technique, but they didn't go into much detail. They just said, oh, like the pre-Raphaelites, um, he did this. Uh, and I was like, I really want this book to expound more upon that, but that didn't happen. <laughs> and it was just such a thing where 
and just kind of coming across that concept a little bit at a time. And that's essentially the technique that Bob Ross used and his predecessor had used in oils. And it also refers, the book referred to it being done in the 1800s or 1700s in oils and watercolor. So I just really want to learn more about that. So it's just slowly picking through stuff and seeing what comes and happens. I'm just trying to push some more white on here. Okay, so let me know what you think about that white. I don't, I don't like that. I feel like that's too much. the tonality of that one cloud right in there. All right, let's dry this off and we'll see. All right, so the movement in the sky from the white gouache shows up a lot more in person than it does on camera. Uh, right away, I saw that the tonal variety, this, the tonal values of this boat had to be darker. That's probably one of the issues of watercolors as you focus on just tonal values. If you're not prepared for it and things dry lighter, you're going to start having issues um, with how things stay. I think the major takeaways from this painting was the directional of brush marks, um, the gouache washes were quite fun, this is some Prussian blue, which I am just trying to increase the intensity of. I feel like I'm going to be using a lot of Prussian blue in these experiments. And I think that kind of attests to the quality of the paper is that there's going to be multiple layers and kind of that wiping back and forth as I experiment and learn. The how much abuse the water the paper can take. It's a mixture of that Prussian blue and burnt sienna. Just trying to build up that tonal value. And I th think that's why watercolor studies, like some washes and things like that, kind of turn me off. It's that they are just. Um, too tonally light. I think it's very, very common for that to happen. And if you follow my painting channel, I mean, obviously you know that I love watercolors, but I love the darker, moodier aspects of it. There we go. Let's see if that helped. Let me know if those marks, if you liked bringing that there, help down. A bit of texture on that each front. Let's do one last dry off. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of back and forth in these videos. Oh my god. Uh, this this cloud, I want to, I mentioned earlier how I lost the tonality of it and I wanted, you know what, I'm going to bring it back. Um, I think it's fun. I'm loving these experiments. I'm laughing at myself. Um, for what I say and then what kind of 
picks at my brain a little bit, but I think that's a good thing. And I think it shows what's important for me. Um, and that's a, actually, that's a Carlson quote as well. Like what you choose to put in, what you choose to omit um, is the artist's signature essentially. That's way too dark. Go off. So, um, obviously you can see what my mind is gearing towards. So look at the original painting. Um, try it for yourself. And let me know what you think is important in the original painting. And that'll be y'all letting your artist signature come out. I just, uh, I'm not a fan of the cauliflower edges and things like that. This is too much fun. Let's start our last dry off. All right, so I'll show you all how I'm signing these uh, whenever I'm doing these master studies and attributing the master. Um, so I'll put my name. I'll say who it's after. This is a Noodler's Boston safety pen. Um, it has platinum carbon ink in it. Well, I hope you enjoyed. Um, if you have any questions, comments, suggestions, anything like that, let me know. If you want to support this channel, a whole bunch of links below. And we got a hammy. Hey, hammy. All right. Y'all take care.